Good evening, everybody. I'd uh, like to welcome you all on behalf of the Ellen Miller Institute uh, for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. As most of you know, uh, we are an institute housed within Berkeley Law. We have a visiting faculty and scholar program. Our visiting faculty and scholars teach uh, across campus 19 classes this year alone. And we host uh, public uh, academic and student programs like tonight's event uh, quite frequently. Tonight you're joining us for the third annual Lubitsky Lecture on Israel and the Great Powers. Uh, our focus tonight is the case of Israel and Turkey. Prior conversations have been on the relations between Israel and China, the relations between Israel and Russia, and uh, Moses and I are plotting uh, future talks about Israel-India, Israel-Saudi Arabia. It'll go on for uh, about 200 sessions and then we'll come back. Uh, after we do Palau, we'll come full circle again and we'll start, we'll start again with China. Uh, I am very grateful, we are all very grateful, to Moses Lubitsky and the Lubitsky Family Foundation for the generous gift that makes this lecture series possible. because it has allows us to explore Israel's relationship with all these regional and global powers, or as we, as we name them, the great and not so great powers. Today, uh, for today, we selected the case of Israel and Turkey because of uh, interesting developments in the last few years between the two countries. Uh, the, 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 the two countries have seen very turbulent times, and, uh, but in the last, I'd say, two to five years, Israel-Turkish ties have undergone a revival we, we planned this talk and chose our speaker many, many months ago. We could not have anticipated the catastrophe uh, and the tragedy uh, that hit Turkey uh, last week, taking tens of thousands of lives, turning upside down everything we, we thought we knew about uh, Turkey uh, and, and, its, and its status, its relationship with, with Israel, with the rest of the world. Uh, so so uh, we're hoping to learn uh, a lot tonight. And, uh, Nobody is better positioned to teach us than our guest, uh, Sonar Chaptai, uh, who is the Bayer Family Fellow and Director of the Turkish Research Program at the Washington Institute. He has written extensively on US-Turkish relations, Turkish domestic politics, Turkish nationalism. He's published in scholarly journals and major international print media, including Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, Foreign Affairs, Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera. He's a regular columnist for Hurriyet Daily, uh, Turkey's oldest and most influential English language paper. He appears regularly on CNN, Fox News, NPR, BBC, and CNN Turk. His uh, latest book, do you have it here? Yes. You have it here, Sultan in Autumn, Erdogan Faces Turkey's Uncontainable Forces, was published two years ago by I.B. Taurus. And his books have been published, uh, been translated into Turkish, Italian, Greek, Romanian, and Croatian. Dr. Chaptai is the recipient of numerous honors, grants, and chairs, including Smith Richardson, Mellon, you're taking notes about all this? Rice. Good. Uh, Rice and Leyland Fellowships, as well as the Ertegun Chair at Princeton. In 2012, he was named an American Turkish Society Young Society leader, and in case you're not impressed enough, he is a uh, registered yoga teacher. <laughs> in case you were wondering. Uh, so Soner is going to offer some opening remarks, uh, and then he and I will engage in a brief conversation. While we do that, members of the Helen Diller Institute team will be passing out note cards and pencils for the Q&A portion um, so please write down your questions. We're going to collect those note cards, and then I will sort of collate your questions and address them to our speaker. After the talk, Sonar will stay on and continue the conversation with students only. So that's an opportunity for our undergraduate and graduate students to, to have some more uh, sort of intimate interaction with our guest. So if you are a student, please join us at 7.30, all the way in the back of the room. Um, and if you're uh, not a student, we will bid you farewell at that point in time. <laughs> <clears throat> Would you like to come up and say a few words, please? Let's welcome our guest. Uh, thank you so much, Ron. Um, you can hear me, right, in the back? Raise your hand. Excellent. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to start by thanking, of course, uh, first of all, Ron for introducing me with kind words, as well as uh, my friend uh, Moses Lubitsky for sponsoring this lecture series and inviting me, and I'm honored to be the uh, third uh, person to deliver this lecture, moving on to Israel's environment. Uh, you guys have done uh, greater powers outside of the region. If you came to the other two lectures, now we're focusing more on Israel's uh, closer neighborhood in Turkey. I also want to thank the university and, and of course, uh, the center for inviting me. And, uh, and Rebecca and Matthew who worked hard to get me here. It took a lot of work. So I'm really pleased to be here. And I'll, uh, Ron and I agreed that I would uh, present a short keynote uh, because we really want to have as many questions as possible and engage in the discussion. So what I thought I would do is uh, do uh, a short presentation on the historic drivers of Turkish-Israeli relationship, kind of tell you some of the historic landmarks and turning points. And then we'll do the great power competition, part of it, which is today's world, in the Q&A. Uh, happy to go back to some of these historic drivers, if you would like to raise them. And then, uh, of course, today's world is a complicated world. You have um, a multipolar world where uh, superpowers are trying to find middle uh, 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 powers to multiply their power, uh, strength across the world. Turkey and Israel are both middle powers in their region and, and globally. So their story is an interesting one. But I think understanding Turkish-Israeli ties really goes back to looking at how this relationship started. Uh, Turkey is the first Muslim-majority country that recognized Israel in 1949, a year after it was established, and it remained as the only Muslim-majority country that had ties with Israel until Camp David. So for about uh, 1940s to 1970s, three decades, it was the only uh, ally Israel had in its region, as well as having uh, warm ties uh, with it, diplomatic and others. Uh, the relationship went through different phases, uh, but I think you need to start by looking at uh, why this was a warm relationship from the beginning. For Israelis, the answer is very simple. Uh, when Israel was established, they realized that the uh, Arab countries around them would be hostile to Israel. That has changed since, uh, but that was in the 1940s. So the Israeli strategy was to have a ring of allies that encircled the Arab countries that encircled Israel. Think of two concentric circles, Israel at the center, around it you have Arab majority states, and the Israelis went and sought good friendship with the states that encircled the Arab majority states that in return encircled Israel. So they went to Iran, uh, didn't work out so well, uh, but they went to Turkey, Ethiopia, India, and other countries and built strong relationships with them. And uh, the Israel-India relationship has since blossomed. Um, Israeli-Ethiopian relationship ended up with the evacuation of Ethiopian Jews, uh, and Eritrean Jews as well. And the relationship with Turkey has gone through significant ups and significant downs. The first uh, 50 year is mostly good, and then you had downs, especially in the last 10 years during the reign of President Erdogan in Turkey. But before I continue, of course, uh, since this is a, although this is a conversation on Turkey-Israel, I also want to join Ron um, in moving into Turkey and to uh, recognize the, uh, the humanitarian disaster ha that has hit Turkey. It's uh, one of epic proportions. Uh, indeed, uh, nothing like this has happened in Turkey's history. It's the biggest natural disaster. More people have died in it and lost their lives than in any other natural disaster, and the death toll is going up. Uh, just to give you, uh, I don't have to describe it here. When I do lectures on the East Coast, I say Richter scale. People say, what is that? You guys, you guys know it here. So on the Richter scale, the first uh, strike was 7.8. The second one, that was an aftershock that came three hours later, was 7.6. The aftershock was a record for the region, and the first shock was, of course, a record on top of that. And it happened in the middle of the night at 1.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. It was also freezing temperatures when it happened. Anatolia was experiencing a snowstorm. It was about 20 degrees. So after the first shock, people really had to go into buildings because it was freezing. And the second shock came, and some of these buildings that look safe, like safe collapsed. Uh, and of course, that added to the uh, disastrous uh, nature of this uh, calamity. Uh, the death toll keeps climbing up, and I think uh, I've seen tons of fundraisers, of course. Uh, this is really a time of uh, assistance to Turkey's citizens. Every country has done well. Uh, that includes the United States, uh, significant assistance. All of Turkey's neighbors, including Greece, 
which has uh, produced an improvement in ties with Greece, and Israel has also flown in assistance. That's significant. I'll come to that. Uh, because this tells us about this deep nature uh, of this relationship that goes back uh, decades. In fact, uh, anybody wants to guess the largest rescue team that was flown into Turkey after the earthquake? Yeah. Azerbaijan? I, I tricked you. Um, and second one is Israel, pretty significant, and other countries have also come in and provided help. So Turks and Israelis decided they would have a strong relationship from the very beginning. For the Israelis, this was driven by their strategic view of their environment. And I think for Turkey, this was a Cold War decision. Turkey wanted to join the United States at the beginning of the Cold War because this was uh, seen as a protector, the US against Russia and the Soviet Union. And um, uh, Israel, though not immediately a US ally, uh, at least in the first 10 years, gradually moved closer to the United States. And by late 1950s, it looked like the two countries had, Turkey and Israel, that is, had bonded. Uh, at the time, uh, Arab countries were going through their socialist revolutionary phase, the Ba'ath Party revolutions in Iraq and Syria, and Turkey actually came to the brink of war with Syria uh, in 1957 when the regime there was swinging to the left. And so that kind of shows you that from the very beginning, Turkey and Israel shared this perception of threat coming from Syria. It will come into the story later on. Uh, in the, uh, the two countries also signed a defensive treaty in 1950s that was uh, made public only much later, that they would help each other and if uh, one was attacked. Uh, so that's a really strong defense co element of cooperation from the very beginning. Uh, that went through the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, Turkey's policy was never anti-Palestinian, while it recognized and it ties with the Israelis. So for instance, it uh, recognized PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization 1975, and that also had a lot to do with Tur 1970s uh, global political environment. What was the big deal in 1970s that kind of sent a shock through the global economy? It was the oil crisis, right? Oil prices uh, went up, and Turkey is a resource poor country, and Turkey at the time uh, uh, exported uh, a little and imported a lot, uh, not like today, today it exports quite a bit, it was dependent on energy imports and uh, it didn't have the cash to buy oil and because oil prices went up so suddenly, Turkey decided to launch a charm offensive, uh, establishing better ties with Arab majority countries. That is the background within which Turkey established ties with the PLO in 1975. The charm offensive didn't really work out so well. Uh, uh, Turkey also tried to get Arab countries to give it cheap oil, it didn't work out. Turkey tried to get Arab countries to support it on the Cyprus issue. It didn't really work out. So I would say the Turkish-Israeli relationship continued to blossom despite this kind of Turkish opening to the Middle East that came in the 1970s. But the real improvement in the relationship followed in 80s and 90s. This is when you had uh, leaders in Turkey who decided that they would deepen the Turkish-Israeli relationship, uh, starting with Prime Minister Özal. Uh, who in 1980s opened Turkey's economy to the global world, and Uzal also pursued stronger military ties with Israel. Uh, this was promoted later on in 1990s under his successor as prime minister and then as president, Demirel, who uh, I would say during his uh, reign in 1990s, Turkish-Israeli ties hit an all-time high. So you had now a defense cooperation, Turkey bought a lot from Israel, also used Israeli technology to upgrade its weapons. You had intelligence cooperation, and then you also had uh, tourism. Uh, this is a time when Israelis started to visit Turkey in large numbers, about half a million a year. At the time, Israel's population was six million. So if half a million Israelis went to Turkey over a decade, you can do the math. Everybody went at least once. Some people went a few times, depending on how, it, um, you know, how many times they wanted to visit Turkey. And I think this is when uh, you, know, you had flights that were running 20 times a day from Istanbul to Tel Aviv. There were other elements of cooperation. One was, as I mentioned, intelligence cooperation. Uh, Turkey has always fought uh, this group called PKK, Kurdistan Workers' Party. It's on the State Department's list of foreign terrorist organizations. Uh, and in the 1980s, it became clear that the PKK uh, was housed in Syria, and the Syrians provided this group with safe haven. Its founding leader, his name is Öcalan, and uh, he's uh, now in jail in Turkey, but he lived in Damascus in 1970s and through 1980s. 
In fact, the PKK was established in Lebanese occupied, uh, Syrian occupied Lebanese Beka Valley in 1970s. It was a Cold War organization. Uh, Marxist Leninist had the backing of the uh, Syrian Arab Republic and the Soviet Union. So this is a Cold War game, you know, you're always uh, using proxies to undermine your adversaries. And it became very obvious to the Turks that this uh, Marxist group based in Syria, uh, which was carrying out attacks across the border from Sy uh, Syria into Turkey, had the blessing and the welcome of the Arab, uh, Syrian Arab Republic, the Assad regime in Damascus. So the Turks warned the Syrians and said, look, we, we know you have a Jalan, uh, they would send delegations to Damascus, the delegations would come in, the Syrians would say, what proof do you have that he's here? And the Turkish authorities would say, here's his address, this is where he lives. The, next, the Syrians would say, we'll take you to this address tomorrow. They would take the Turkish officials to an empty building. They're like, nobody lives here. This was like a farce, it went on. Then in 1998, Turkish papers, after close cooperation with the Israelis, uh, because this is when Turkish-Israeli relationship is at its best, uh, the two countries kind of signaled that Israel would pressure Syria from the south while Turkey would pressure it from the north, sort of like a sandwich. And uh, the Syrians said, oh, we found a Jalan, he lives here. They expelled him. Uh, then he was caught. He did something uh, that you, he, uh, you should never do if somebody's looking for you, especially if it's a foreign government, which is use your cell phone. <laughs> Ojalan made calls, this is 1990s, he didn't realize that these things can be tracked uh, using his cell phone. He was tracked with US assistance, caught by Turkish officials, brought to Turkey, put on trial, sent to jail, he's now in jail. Um, that was an important kind of delivery point because the Turkish-Israeli relationship had benefited from close uh, intelligence and security cooperation. Trade also boomed in this decade. And then Erdogan won elections in Turkey. It all comes to Erdogan. He won in 2002. In the first decade of Erdogan years, the relationship looked like it was running well. Uh, there were some early warning signs of how Erdogan, uh, who would uh, you know, occasionally espouse anti-Semitic rhetoric, people would say, oh, that's just politics. He doesn't really believe in it. And some others would say, no, take the guy for his face value for what he says. But the first 10 years of the relationship went well. And I think the, the one minute moment that you guys all remember at Davos was a turning incident, right? Uh, Erdogan is sitting with Shimon Peres in the same panel. Uh, I met a number of Israeli leaders, including Peres. I would say uh, of all the Israeli leaders I have met, he was probably the most pro-Erdogan. He liked him, he said, that guy is good. I don't think he's bad for Turkey. He's good influence for world politics. So of, everyone, of all the Israeli politicians, if Erdogan had to pick one to offend, it was the one who was most pro-Erdogan politician. And uh, of course, he walked out of this uh, panel in Davos because he was offended by whatever Paris was saying, or maybe the moderator didn't give Erdogan enough time. He doesn't, Erdogan doesn't speak English. Uh, but he got up, he said, one minute. And that became the one minute uh, intervention because it's like his only utterance of English words ever. So in Turkey, that was seen as a burning, turning point because from then on, Turkish-Israeli relationships started suffering. Erdogan decided that uh, tr departing from Turkey's traditional policy of having good ties with Israelis, but supporting the Palestinians, he decided that he would have not so good ties with the Israelis and not support the, the broader Palestinian movement, just what one faction in it, that is Hamas. So Turkey's Israeli ties turned. Israelis now see Turkey as hostile. It supports Hamas, uh, not the, the uh, Palestinian Authority and the relationship collapsed uh, with the flotilla incident. Uh, this was a flotilla sponsored by the Turkish government, uh, uh, including Erdogan, to bring aid to Gaza, uh, but it, uh, Israelis said, look, there's a blockade. If you send this ship, we'll board it. And the Turkish government insisted, Israelis boarded. Uh, nine uh, Turks on board were killed. One is a Turkish US dual citizen, and the relationship completely collapsed. Uh, the two countries basically pulled their ambassadors, said, no, we're not talking anymore. Intelligence ties continued, I think, to an extent. Uh, trade also continued, which is why I believe that the relationship would always, I always believe that uh, for this decade from 2010 to 20, that the US, the Turkish-Israeli relationship would be restored one day because the two countries never stopped trade. In fact, they kept signing trade agreements while they had no political ties and no more military cooperation. And trade continued to increase as well as economic ties. So 
I mentioned how in the 1990s about half a million Israelis visited Turkey. Um, this is your quiz question, I'm gonna see if you're sharp. So by 2015, uh, or 16 or 17, about a million Israelis flew to Turkey, but they were not visiting Turkey. What were they doing? They were transiting through Istanbul Airport, which is like the global hub for the Israelis if you wanna fly anywhere. Also, they're flying to Turkish Airlines, which has good food. Um, just you know, promotion, yeah. Well, I mean, it has good food if you like eggplant. So, yeah. You know, Turkish cuisine has a million ways to prepare eggplant, so you have to like it, but uh, other, it, it does have good food, yeah. Whether or not you like eggplant, I'm joking. So obviously, uh, this shows you the first element of Turkish-Israeli relationship going forward, economic interdependence. Even when at the, at the bottom of the relationship where they didn't talk to each other, they didn't engage each other, there was so much trade going on. Trade was increasing by 30, 40% a year. And economic interdependence means uh, there are certain things every economy can do with every economy, but there are certain things advanced economies, Israel and Turkey, can only do with other advanced economies, Israel and Turkey. So that's interdependence, right? So Israelis, they wanna fly, they wanna fly through on an, on an airport uh, that's efficient, an airline that functions, and that's the kind of interdependence that I think is an example of. So that's, I think, one element that's going to carry Turkish-Israeli relationship going forward, regardless of who's in charge in Israel and who's in charge in Turkey. There, there's a lot of trade, it's quite significant in volume. Tourism has picked up again, by the way. And the, um, uh, the economic tie, I think, is the bedrock of the Turkish-Israeli relationship. But since the last uh, decade, the two countries have also restored ties. Most recently, they have reappointed ambassadors. And I'll wrap up with this because I do want to uh, move on to looking at the global dynamics today. And uh, one of the elements of normalization is that the Israeli conclusion about Turkey has been, uh, you know, under Erdogan, Turkish-Israeli ties have not been great, but it's better for the Israelis to have engagement with Turkey uh, than not to have engagement with Turkey. Uh, the Turkish side view was for a long time to have a hardline policy of providing strong support to Hamas. I think the Israelis, as a condition for normalization, told Erdogan that uh, even if Hamas stayed in Turkey, it had to be completely quiet for the Israelis to have a reset. So Hamas has now gone completely quiet. Um, and number three, of course, the third element was that they would reinstate ambassadors. That has happened recently. Um, the Turkish view, of course, is that Erdogan launched a policy for about a decade in the, from 2011 onwards with the beginning of the Arab uprisings. That was supposed to make Turkey a star power nation in the Middle East. Everybody was supposed to lead, uh, follow Turkey. Turkey was to, to be the leader country. It didn't really quite work out like that. The policy of supporting Muslim Brotherhood in Arab uprisings left Turkey completely isolated once the Brotherhood was ousted from power in Egypt. And the Brotherhood supporters regionally, which see it as their greatest domestic and international security threat, have opposed Turkey since. Those countries include members of Gulf Cooperation Council, Saudis, Emiratis, Bahrainis, uh, Egypt, Jordan, and of course, uh, it's the, their allies, Israel. Turkey also interfered in the war in Syria. Uh, Assad regime is backed by Russia and Iran, so now it's also on bad terms with Russia and Iran. Basically ended up with no friends as opposed to the fact under Supposition under the Erdogan that it was going to have all friends and it was going to be the leading country. So one conclusion Erdogan has drawn from this is that this policy didn't work out and now he's having resets with all the countries in the region. Um, I would say there's a new alignment in the Middle East. I call it uh, the Middle East Quad. That includes Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and UAE. Turkey has tried to reset ties with all members of the Quad. Uh, and it's reached out to all four. Three of them in the beginning said they're not interested and one said they are interested. And I think that's the most kind of mercantilist member of the Quad, which is UAE. UAE has a financial powerhouse, Dubai. It survives in international trade, investment. And so Emiratis were really interested about the idea that they could buy in Turkey. Turkey's lira has collapsed. It's cheap and affordable and they reached, responded to Erdogan's uh, plans to reset with Turkey. Um, these, uh, Saudis came next, 
Once Erdogan moved uh, the court case over the, the killing of the Washington Post columnist Khashoggi from Turkish courts to Saudi courts, Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy. It's not going to prosecute its monarch. And so the case closed and the Saudis have joined normalization. Egyptians are not on board because I would say of the Quad countries, Egypt is the one that detests Erdogan most. That is because Egypt's leader Sisi, who, was out, who ousted Morsi in 2013, was called by Erdogan as a dictator and labeled as such. And Erdogan tried, threatened to take Sisi to UN Security Council and he's upset about it. I think Egyptians for a long time also held the Israelis. They told the Israelis, they said, look, who's more important to you, us or the Turks? And for the Israelis, Turkey is important, but Egypt, you know, Gaza, uh, Palestinian theater, Egypt is, has much deeper reach inside the Palestinian theater than Turkey can ever imagine. So I think that kind of held the Israelis back, but the Israelis also decided to normalize. Egypt is the last member of the Quad that has not normalized, and I'm happy to look at the depth of that and other issues going forward. But I want to end also by looking at why Turkey is pursuing normalization, because these days, everything you hear about Turkey can have a Turkish explanation about Turkey's national security interests, what is good for Turkey, and simultaneously, it also always says an what is good for Erdogan angle. Erdogan is Turkey's powerful leader, so everything Turkey does, of course, is good for Ankara, but it's also oftentimes also because it's good for Erdogan. So for Erdogan, normalization means the following. Turkey's economy under Erdogan grew for 15 years. Unbroken record, never happened before. He's delivered growth, lifted people out of poverty, improved access to services, incomes rose up, and then the economy went into recession for the first time under him in 2018. That's why he lost elections for mayors in Istanbul, Ankara, other big cities in 2019. Erdogan was lucky that in 2019 there were no national elections, he would have lost them. Economy exited recession, but then the pandemic happened, it went back into recession. And now Turkey has uh, probably hyperinflation, nearly three digits. Uh, it's in really bad shape, so Turkey is a resource poor country, you just heard us. And Erdogan knows that for Turkey's economy to grow, you have to have financial inflows. So he's cultivating good ties with the Emiratis and the Saudis because they have a lot of money. Just as he's cultivating good ties economically with Russia while supporting Ukraine militarily. So for him, uh, restoring ties with the Quad, Middle East Quad, especially wealthy GCC countries, and including Israel, which is not an informal ally member of this alliance, is one way to restore financial inflows and kickstarting economic growth. He wants to have some kind of economic normalcy by the time of the next elections. Elections in Turkey are supposed to be held before June uh, by constitution. Erdogan has said, or his allies have said they may want to postpone the elections because of the earthquake, uh, but you can't do it according to the constitution, so that's tricky. I'm happy to do questions on Turkish domestic politics, though we do want to keep this conversation more on the global aspect of uh, uh, Turkey's foreign policy and its ties with Israel, of course. Last piece. The world in the era of great power competition, which I think is a nice segue to our sit-down conversation. So uh, very simply put, I know I'm simplifying this, there are a lot of political scientists in the room. We had a bipolar order in the Cold War, you know, East and the West. Then we had a unipolar order, uh, 1990s onwards, mostly dominated by the United States. And I think now we have a multipolar world. You got China, you have India rising, you have EU, you have United States, and then you have these middle powers. Some of them uh, punch above their weight, so they're middle powers, but they do a lot. Turkey's an example. You know, it interferes in wars in Libya, South Caucasus, it has bases in Somalia, Qatar, and it's doing well, militarily speaking. And uh, Israel, I think, is similarly a middle power, and I think the view of the world these days is, um, if you get along with, it's not like it's binary, where it was the Cold War, you were either in the West or in the East. It's not like the unipolar world where everybody's kind of aligned with the US or listened to it or didn't challenge it. It's a multipolar world where countries agree on one area and they disagree on another area. So Turkey and Israel can be friends in the South Caucasus, where they both support Azerbaijan, and they oppose each other in East Med, East, East Mediterranean, that is, where Greece, Israel has become good friends with Greece and Turkey opposes Greece. So 
I think that Turkish-Israeli relationship is moving into its third phase historically. The first phase was 1948 until Erdogan. The second phase, and everybody knows what it's called, the Erdogan phase, right, basically, 20 years. And now the third phase is the multipolar world. You know, it's as uh, unpredictable as it can be. Um, you know, most of these developments, I mean, Chinese flying balloons over us, who would have guessed? You know, you would have ruled them out a few years ago. So I think this is a relationship that can bring forward cooperation, Turkey and Israel, in, depending on where you are, or confrontation, depending on where you are. But the base of it, I think, remains economic. That's why I, I think this, I'm confident that this relationship will survive, because it has a very strong economic foundation. You have uh, businesses in both countries that want to see this relationship thrive. You have economic interdependence, you know, advanced economies being able to do stuff with only advanced economies. So that kind of means that they have to do stuff together. And then, of course, uh, huge amounts of tourism and interpersonal exchange, which also adds to it. I'd like to stop here because I want to make sure we have time for questions and also looking into some of the global dynamics. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, great pleasure to be here. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. You can use that one. I'll try to use this one, if I can turn it on. It's working, it's a miracle. Thank you, that was awesome and fast. Um, and it was an excellent history tour. So now that we've done the history tour, let's do a bit of a geography tour. Starting uh, as you ended, uh, maybe with uh, Greece, Cyprus. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, East Med, and brings to mind the East Med pipeline. So tell us a little about this uh, uh, increasingly improving relationship or tightening of economic ties between Israel, Cyprus, and Greece, and how that plays off against the Israel-Turkey relationship. Right, so um, for a very long time, um, the United States, I'm gonna start with US-Turkey, because it will very quickly come to uh, uh, Turkey, Israel, and uh, East Med. For a very long time, the United States considered Israel and Turkey as its uh, key allies in building a security architecture regarding East Mediterranean. It relied on these two countries until the middle of the Erdogan era, until around 2010-11. And then the US and Turkey started to break on issues, on Arab uprisings, what to do in Egypt and Syria. And at the time, uh, this was a quite important change because traditionally, um, uh, Greece as a country, the United States did not rely on in making policy. Uh, Greece uh, had a strong history of being leftist. Um, it went through a civil war in 1940s uh, where the U.S. helped defeat communists. And there's, uh, there were, historically and still are, very powerful anti-American sentiments across Greek society, including for U.S. role in the civil war. And the Greeks believed that the United States did not support them enough in Cyprus in that war in 1974. And so, um, basically the U.S. relied on Turkey and Israel. Then Turkey kind of uh, departed, started to do its own things, and the United States decided that it would do more with Greece. And Greece kind of started to pivot to the United States. Now you could remove U.S. out of it and put Israel in there, and everything I've told you applies to Turkey, Greece, and Israel. So for a very long time, Israel and Turkey were great friends. And then under Erdogan years, this relationship started to show signs of uh, fracturing. Israel and Greece never had good ties, traditionally speaking. Uh, Greeks were more pro-Palestinian than being pro-Israeli up until the last 10 years. Uh, same also applies to Cyprus, the, or the Greek part of it. And that relationship also shifted. I think um, whoever is in Athens, uh, or Greek foreign ministry, who saw that Turkey's departure from being Israel's best ally in the East Med opened up space for Greece to fill in, should be given the Nobel Peace uh, Prize on Foreign Affairs. I don't, no prize exists, I'm making it up. But I'm just basically showing you that there was something visionary in Athens. People said, Turkey, which is a, you know, which Greece is as a competitor country, realized that Turkey is exiting uh, East Med it's no more considered a strong ally by the United States or by Israel. And the Greeks said, oh, we can fill in this position that is left behind, vacant by the Turks. So now, 
Greece is uh, U.S.'s, I would say, uh, one of best allies in the East Med, and for the Israelis, Greece has also become a very powerful ally. I think that's one reason why Turkey decided to make up with Israel. I explained various reasons, Erdogan's calculus, Turkey's own sense of isolation. So one of the reasons I think that uh, the Turkish-Israeli relationship for a very long time, because they never became, Turkey and Israel never became formal allies. It was for a long time described that uh, it was never uh, formalized, there was never anything signed, and I think this is because Turkey could play hard to get regarding Israel. For five decades, six decades actually, from 1950s until 2010s, Israel had just Turkey as a friend, and then when it had peace with Egypt, just two countries, and then Jordan, three countries. Israel had only three countries that were friends in an area from Morocco to India. That was for about six decades. So Turkey could play hard to get, right? Because it was one of the three countries that Israel could consider a friend, and it was, one of the th it was actually the country that had the oldest relationship with Israel, but it was slim pickings for Israel. Now fast forward, how many friends does Israel have now in this space from Morocco to India? It's like 10, right? You have UAE, you have Bahrain, uh, you have Azerbaijan, you have Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Sudan. Who would have thought Sudan would have normalized with Israel? It's incredible. So now I think Israelis can play hard to get because they have so many friends and Turkey has fewer friends than before. So one of the reasons Turkey normalized with Israel was they realized Israelis were becoming close friends with Greece. And you know, Turkey and Greece are competitors and Ankara didn't like that. Israel was becoming good friends with Greece and the Turkish thinking was, oh, let's go back to the Israelis and become good friends with them. Israelis said, we'll become good friends with you but we'll still keep our friendship with the Greeks. So they're not putting all, the, putting all their as in, into one basket. They're basically saying, we'll have good friends with uh, ties with Greece, we'll also improve our ties simultaneously with Turkey. And uh, I think the way East Mediterranean landscape is evolving, uh, Israelis will have uh, good ties with Turkey and Greece simultaneously and they'll have separate tracks. So with Turkey, maybe they'll have some energy cooperation. So Israel has a lot of gas, well, a lot is relative. I mean, Israel has a lot of gas compared to its gas needs. Like, it has extra gas, but what it has is a dent in the ocean, if you consider, for example, what Qatar has. It's a small amount in the global market, but it's a big amount for Israel, so they want to export it. This has been going on for like 15 years, I think. Like, first they had to decide on it, they said we'll go green, they still have extra gas, they couldn't decide on the, uh, on the mechanics of it. So if you take gas out, there are two ways to export it. You can turn it into liquid, and that's LNG, and then you have to put it on tankers, it goes to another place, it's turned into gas form again, and that requires really expensive infrastructure. So Israeli gas kind of, kind of is profitable if you do this transition, but uh, on top of it, they also want to build a pipeline to export it, that provides you with a safe way to export it. For a long time, the idea was to build a pipeline, because Israel and Turkey didn't get along, that went under the East Med uh, across 1,600 miles to Greece. That pipeline would be more expensive than all the money the Israelis would make from the gas. So it was a pipe, pipe dream, I guess. But it, it was kind of Israelis saying to Turks, we don't have to do this with you, we have the Greeks. It worked, right? The Turks said, oh, no, don't do it with the Greeks, we'll come, now, do it with us. So now the idea is maybe a shorter pipeline to Turkey, only 60 miles, not 1,600, but 60 miles. So that means Israelis can actually make money from selling the gas because the pipeline is not a big investment. Uh, we'll see if that happens uh, because it also requires going around Cyprus. It's tricky if you build this on seabed near Cyprus. Cyprus cannot say no, but it can review this project environmentally. It's not easy, so you need a lot of good international lawyers. But So basically, I think what we have seen is a diversification of allies for Israel in the East Med. It went from having just Turkey and kind of Egypt to having Turkey, Egypt, Greece, and Cyprus. 
Turkey is now saying, pick me first. Israelis are like, no, we did this mistake before. We're not going to do it again. We'll deal with you. We'll deal with the others as well. Uh, and you could also talk about the East Mediterranean Quad. That's a term very popular now because countries are coming together in their of great power competition, setting up ad hoc uh, blocks. You know, like two or three countries set up blocks and they say they're allies. And these blocks are sometimes exclusive, sometimes they're not. So Israelis, Egyptians, Greeks, and Cypriots are have coming together in various fora in the East Med, energy-related, natural gas-related, and each time these initiatives have excluded Turkey. And I think that's one of the other reasons why Erdogan decided that he wanted to get into the game. So uh, I guess going forward, uh, Israel will continue to have um, strong uh, uh, defense and military cooperation with Greece and Cyprus. And it will continue to have strong economic ties with Turkey. And it will think about whether to restart defense cooperation with Turkey. It hasn't done it yet. So far, this is political normalization. Economic ties were always strong. They continue to be strong. But defense cooperation has not really kicked in yet. I think Israelis are kind of waiting because they normalized with Turkey once before, after the flotilla in 2016. Flotilla was in 2010. So in 2016, they normalized, and then Erdogan kicked out the Israeli ambassador. This time, the Israelis are going slower. They're saying, you know, we did this before. I think it's called Lad Lad. You know, they're like, we did this before. We rushed. It didn't work out so well. This time, we go slowly, slowly, which is Yavash Yavash in Turkish. I think same in colloquial Hebrew. Uh, and it, maybe it will work. Uh, this time, Israelis are kind of like moving uh, slower going forward. And I think what happened, um, after the uh, terrible earthquake, of course, is encouraging. Israelis were uh, the, the blew in one of the largest teams, rescue teams, 450 people. Azerbaijanis brought in 750. Uh, France brought in a large team. Uh, Turkish Cyprus, a friend of Turkey, of course. And uh, Greece also brought in a very large team. And they all, um, some of these countries, not only helped tremendously, but I think this also really uh, created extremely positive sentiments among the population. I would say Israel's standing probably has improved significantly in Turkey, uh, as well as the standing of Greece, for example, because they've all flown in assistance. And, and Israelis and Greeks, and I think the Spaniards also have done a good job of publicizing their assistance. They tweet about it. They tweet about it in Turkish. Um, you know, I, I think this is uh, perhaps an era of uh, what you call public diplomacy, where you help a country and you have human-to-human -human contact, and people remember that forever. So I, I feel that the assistance Israelis have flown in together with what the Greeks have done and Americans and French uh, will really, I think, introduce a different mindset. Um, I, I was doing a panel uh, for my office at the Washington Institute yesterday, and uh, someone from the uh, U.S. government asked a question. They said, are we going to see a reset in Turkish-U.S. Uh, ties, or a reset in Turkish-Israeli ties, you could extend it, or reset in Turkish-Greek ties? I said, not in diplomatic ties, but in people-to-people -people ties, yes. Because for a very long time, about a decade, President Erdogan in Turkey framed the West as being Turkey's other. He said, the West doesn't like us, it opposes us, and that includes Israel, US, and NATO members, and EU members. And the earthquake has shown to the Turks that at the end of the day, the people who came to help them are members of the West. It is the Israelis, Americans, Greeks, the Spanish, and the French, and the, and the Swedes, and the Germans. So I think this is a significant uh, improvement of Turkish views of uh, uh, countries nearby Turkey. And Israelis did a, a quite good job in, uh, I, I think, uh, both helping uh, Turkey as uh, earthquake survivors as well as publicizing this. So uh, it's, it's one positive takeaway of today's conversation. Great. So you, you mentioned uh, two countries that I bet people in the audience uh, didn't expect to hear about today. <clears throat> one of those is Azerbaijan and the other is India. Um, and those relationships are complicated when you think about Israel-Azerbaijan, Turkey-Azerbaijan, Israel-India, Turkey-India, and then, of course, Pakistan plays into it as well. You want to say a few sentences about how these relationships are simple and how they're complicated? Yeah, so let me do uh, separately. Uh, do Azerbaijan and South Caucasus first. Um, so there are three countries in the South Caucasus. There's Georgia, 
How many of you have been? It's really fabulous, good wine. Uh, and there's also Azerbaijan and Armenia that don't get along, that have fought a long war over this region of Azerbaijan called Nagorno-Karabakh. It's an autonomous part of Azerbaijan that was occupied by Armenian troops and the Azeris wanted to take it back. They tried, they tried, it didn't work out. They tried in 2020 and it worked out. So I just described, I said, you know, Turkey and Israel are in this third phase of their relationship. It's the great power era in which they'll agree on certain things and they'll disagree on certain things. South Caucasus is an area where Turkey and Israel agree. Uh, they're both allies of Azerbaijan. It's fascinating because this also tells us something about Iran. You know, so Iran is majority Shia and the assumption is that Iran supports Shia Muslims everywhere. Sometimes it does, so for example in Lebanon, Iran's biggest ally and proxy is Hezbollah which is Shia. In the Palestinian theater, Iranians support Hamas, which is Sunni. In the South Caucasus, there are three countries. Iran's ally is not Azerbaijan, which is both Muslim and Shia, but it's Armenia, which is Christian. So Iranian foreign policy uses religion, but it's really more about being hegemonic. They'll ally with anybody. They don't have to be Muslim or Shia if they were Muslim, so long as they are friends and allies of Iran. So I consider it to be kind of a hegemonic power. And so they have allied with the uh, uh, Armenians for a long time. And the Azerbaijanis used this. They reached out to the Israelis. They said, look, uh, we don't get along with the Armenians. You guys don't get along with the Iranians. You know, Iranians and Armenians are together. Why don't we get together? Simple. So. Uh, uh, Israelis provided Azerbaijan with military assistance, drones. Turkey provided Azerbaijanis with military assistance, also drones. These days, if you don't have drones, you don't have a military. You know, I think things have changed. It's not like the old-fashioned military where it's all about tanks and airplanes. Basically, it's people sitting in Nevada and pl flying planes across the world. Uh, these are called drones. And uh, those drones helped Ar Ar Azerbaijanis execute a war. They defeated Armenian forces. They took almost all of Nagorno-Karabakh. Russia came in as a peacekeeper in quotes, and the war stopped. And Azerbaijanis made a famous, uh, you know, a quite impressive victory. In fa in return this of, uh, of returning this favor, Azerbaijanis have just established full diplomatic ties with Israel, and they have sent an ambassador for the first time. I think this is a way of thanking Israel. And in this theater, of course, Turkey. Israel and Azerbaijan are allies. Let's move on to India, because now this is an area where Turkey and Israel are not allies. So South Asia, the biggest conflict is uh, since the partition, unfortunately. India and Pakistan don't get along. They have come to the brink of war. They're both nuclear powers. We hope they never get into war. And they oppose each other. In South Asia, Turkey's ally is Pakistan. Israel's ally is India. So here, they're not going to get along, never. They'll always oppose each other, they always partner with different countries. And I think uh, while the Israeli-Indian relationship has blossomed, similarly the Turkish-Pakistani relationship has blossomed, and they're, they're close to each other, they cooperate quite significantly. Um, I should explain, since I'm an historian and a nerd, uh, the reason why Turkey likes Pakistan and Pakistan likes Turkey. So um, it goes back to British occupation of India or uh, British India. Uh, that included India and Pakistan, of course. And at the time, there was a, uh, you know, a nationalist movement. It wanted to kick the Brits out of the Indian subcontinent. And this movement basically uh, mobilized. You know, Gandhi was a leader of it. Uh, they tried to have elections and kick the Brits out. And World War I broke up, and the Brits occupied Istanbul at the end of the war. They defeated the Ottoman Empire. And Indian Muslims, you know, who basically wanted to stick it to the Brits wherever they could, had a massive fundraising campaign because they thought that Istanbul was occupied. Caliph, the leader for the Sunni Muslim community, was under threat. And this is called the Caliphate Movement. Indian Muslims, I mean, there's, when you think of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh together, that's 450 million people now. So think about that population 100 years ago. Still a large, sizable community. They had a massive fundraise drive. 
uh, tons of cash and gold, and they sent it to the leader of Turkey's nationalist campaign, whose name is Ataturk. And you know what a, I would say a Machiavellian politician Ataturk is. So Ataturk got this money, bought planes with it from Soviet Union, used the planes to defeat the Greeks, and then abolished the caliphate. You see the irony? Indian Muslims thought they were gonna save the caliphate, they helped save Turkey, uh, defeat Greeks, but also end the caliphate. So it's this long historical relationship that goes back about 100 years, but I think it explains why Turkey and Pakistan are close. Uh, Muslims in the subcontinent generally like Turkey, and Turkey generally has had good ties with them, including, of course, Pakistan. Great, thank you. Very interesting. Um, uh, several questions from the audience about the Jewish community in Turkey and its role in Israel-Turkey relations. And I'll add to that a question of my own about the American Jewish community and its role in Israel-Turkey-US relations. Right. So let me start with the second part because that was a building block of the US-Turkish relationship in the 1980s. Turkey's uh, prime minister, uh, his name is Azal at the time, realized that there's not really a large Turkish-American community, so there's no pro-Turkey voice on the hill. And he decided, therefore, to ally with the American Jewish community, and Turkey and Israel are good friends, and his thinking was this would translate into a stronger pro-Turkish voice inside the Congress. It indeed happened. Uh, as a result of that, U.S.-Turkish relationship deepened, Turkey joined F-16 project, which it was NATO's, it's NATO's current fighter jet project that's been phased out in favor of F-35s, and that relationship uh, blossomed. I think one of the problems of the Erdogan era is that Turkey lost not only um, an important ally, Israel, but it also lost strongly pro-Turkish voices inside the U.S. Congress. Now Erdogan is trying to restore this. I think one of the reasons it's one of the reasons why he's pursuing normalization. Uh, on the uh, Turkish-Jewish community side, uh, Turkey still has the largest Jewish community in any Muslim-majority country. Uh, still, that's a pretty important uh, record of establishment, but it's a tiny community of only 20,000 people. Turkey's population is 84 million, uh, mostly Sephardic in Istanbul and the smaller part in Izmir, Turkey's biggest port, um, extremely well integrated, about more than half of the marriages are intermarriages with Muslims and people of other faiths or no faith, and um, has suffered from the rise of anti-Semitism, I would say broadly speaking in the last 10 years, unfortunately. Numbers of people who make Aliyah to Israel have increased, and when I say increase, it went from you know, 40 to 60 or 40 to 80 a year. It's a small community. But still, that's significant because in the long term, it means the community may not survive. The numbers are not increasing. There are only about 18, 20,000. That's kind of where it has stabilized. Uh, I hope that the normalization with Israel will also translate into Erdogan embracing uh, less of anti-Semitic rhetoric. He's done this quite a bit in the past. As I said, people ignored it in general. People said that's politics, but I think, of course, for Turkey's Jews, that's become a, a reality and that they have to endure. Uh, and I, uh, the community enjoys uh, full, religious, full religious freedoms. There are Jewish schools, hospitals, newspapers, community centers. And I'm sure some of you who have been to Turkey have visited synagogues. They're beautiful. Some of them are from 16th century, uh, built by Spanish Jews. They usually have a bima in the middle in the form of a ship because that's what brought the Jews over from Spain. How many of you guys have been to Turkey, by the way? Just curious. Great crowd. Okay, nice. Um, explain Erdogan's infatuation with Hamas and why Hamas and not the Palestinian Authority, given the fact that it then puts Turkey in a tough position also with both with Egypt and with Israel. So Erdogan obviously uh, believes that mixing politics and religion is good and he wants to mix his idea of Islam with politics. That's what's called political Islam. I just explained it to you. So um, he's trying to say, um, basically, that the way he approaches life and his values should be embraced by others, and if not, it's, uh, it's uh, tough for them. Uh, 
his movement called Justice and Development Party, AKP, is a movement that largely espouses worldview. It's not why it won elections in Turkey. It won elections in Turkey primarily because Erdogan also delivered growth for about 15 years, really phenomenal, improved uh, services, incomes, access to the pie. It is why he lost elections in 2019. Luckily for him, there were elections for local government. And it's why the next elections are a toss up. The economy is re not completely bounced back from recession. It's not doing very well. But his, so I think the point I'm trying to raise is the movement that Erdogan represents uh, is one that has succeeded because Erdogan did well, so well economically speaking, and now the movement that Erdogan uh, leads is facing a challenge. But this is also a movement that has sympathies for similar political movements, which is, uh, I guess, Hamas is one version of it, also political Islamist. Erdogan uh, empathizes with it. I think he thinks that uh, this uh, movement should be given a chance uh, to be recognized as legitimate. I think he will probably never give up on this idea. He may stop supporting Hamas, but he will never denounce it. That's my guess. And right now, I would say he hasn't really uh, quite stopped supporting Hamas, but he doesn't allow Hamas freedom of movement anymore in Turkey, so that's a step. The next step would be Turkey expelling Hamas. May or may not happen. Uh, the next step would be Erdogan denouncing Hamas, which I think will never happen. Erdogan has also supported Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which is also a political Islamist movement. Uh, I'm not saying Muslim, I described to you what political Islam is. And he decided that uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood would be an ally for Turkey. So Egypt is a really interesting country. It uh, does not invent all trends in Arab countries. But if it adopts a trend, it can make it hegemonic because it's the most populous Arab country. Uh, the old saying uh, in the 20th century and before was that Cairo wrote, so Egyptians were the intellectuals, Beirut printed, that's where production took place, creative classes, and Baghdad read. That's where you know, illiterate, illiterate people were and discussion took place. I guess you can't say that anymore, unfortunately. Uh, some of these traditions have disappeared. But Cairo uh, writes, it's the center of intellectual production, and so Erdogan's thinking was, if you support Muslim Brotherhood in the Arab uprisings, if they succeed in Egypt, uh, that will multiply Erdogan's power because the Brotherhood is an Erdogan ally. It didn't quite work out like that because the Brotherhood rose to power in Egypt, and then it fell from power even quicker, and so Turkey squandered all its uh, to-be-found influence in the Arab uprisings. I think Erdogan's biggest problem, in quotes, whether it's with Hamas or the Brotherhood, is that so he's quite pragmatic. You know, he can do 180s with Israel, break relationships, restore relationship, break again, restore again. But he's also ideological in the sense that if he interferes in another country's politics, which is what he did in uh, Palestinian politics and also in Egyptian politics, uh, he goes for his ideological kin, which is the Brotherhood or Hamas. So if you're a crafty practitioner of foreign policy, and if you're going to interfere in the affairs of a country, do you, oh, well, let me put it differently. If you are gambling in a horse race, do you put all your money behind one horse, or do you spread it around? Because that horse might win, but if, what if he loses? You lose everything. I think Erdogan is like the person who goes to the horse race and puts all his money behind one horse. The horse is called the uh, Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas, and for him it didn't work out so well because he thought the Brotherhood was going to win, in which case his influence would have multiplied, but the Brotherhood has lost, in which case, of course, Turkey squandered all its influence. So I think the Hamas question and the Brotherhood question is an interesting one because I get this question a lot. People say, is he ideological? Is he pragmatic? I think he's both. He can do these 180s, but then there are places where his sympathies for political Islamist movements take over him, and he basically makes uh, judgment calls based on that. You're speaking about him as if, as if all of Turkey's decisions are entirely in his hands. Is there a close circle of confidants whose loyalty he relies on? Uh, is, it, uh, is, it, is, is the support of his party 
crucial? Does he have a broad popular base? Uh, he's not a dictator yet. Yeah, I just wrote a book called The New Sultan. So, uh, no, he's not a dictator. So here's how Erdogan functions. He established a political movement called AKP that came to power 20 years ago. And ironic because it came to power after another big earthquake in Turkey in 1999 that destroyed centrist parties because they were so bad in delivering assistance afterwards that the electorate voted them out. And this was followed by a massive economic crisis a year after the earthquake. So at the time Erdogan set up a political party. The party had in it political Islamists, but also others. It had business liberals, conservatives, center-right people. So it was kind of like a rainbow coalition of the political right, everybody in it. Over the years, this uh, movement shrunk and it uh, ejected everything but political Islamists. So it kind of went to core. And then in the last 10 years, even political Islamists have been ejected from this movement. Now I think Erdogan's AKP is a party in which being loyal to Erdogan is the only ideology. So just as I think in Turkey, he's cutting out institutions and replacing capable leaders. I'm not talking about other countries, just Turkey. He's gutting out institutions, replacing executives, not with people who are the best for the job, but the people who are loyal to him. So that's one of the things we have seen after this terrible earthquake. Turkey's relief agencies have been very slow in delivering aid. Because in some cases, these relief agencies have turned into zombie agencies, which means uh, the person running Turkey's version of FEMA uh, is probably not a person whose job is uh, emergency relief, but who is an Erdogan loyalist. And of course, when disaster happens, they don't really know what to do. So the question about Erdogan is that he went from running a very broad political movement that included various shades, everything from centrists to center right to conservatives to political Islamists, to one that got rid of centrists, got rid of business liberals, center-right people, ended up just with political Islamists, and to one that stopped being ideological and just turned into a movement of people who are loyal to him. I'm a great believer in term limits after having studied Erdogan's career. I think if he had left politics after his second or third term, we'd be talking about him fondly today. Say so he did so well for Turkey, economy grew, he doubled incomes. Yeah, he did this and that wrong, but overall, his legacy would be quite positive. But he has now run Turkey for five terms. And of course, uh, that I think is an argument to be made in uh, favor of uh, term limits. His legacy will be much different after five terms than would have been the case after two terms. Uh, another complex mess uh, on, in, in the neighborhood is uh, the Syrian civil war, which Turkey is involved with intensely, both in fighting, in supporting some groups but not others, but also as the main target of refugees that are, that are, are fleeing Syria. How does that complicate the Israel-Turkey relationship? Or do Turkey and Israel's interests in Syria align? So here's an interesting t uh, study for us to look at how Turk and Israel agree on one place and disagree on another place. So broadly speaking, uh, both Turk and Israel in Syria have an agreement with Russia. For Israel, the agreement is that Israel can go after Hezbollah and Iran, Iranian bases. For Turkey, it's an agreement that Turkey can go after the PKK or groups aligned with it. So R Russia controls Syrian airspace. It has air defense systems. If Russia doesn't allow you to go in, your plane can be shot down. So Israelis have this you know, gentle person's agreement with Russia. If they need to go in and strike an Iranian or Hezbollah target, they have to talk to the Russians. It's one reason why I think Israelis have not fully supported Ukraine, because they're afraid that they're gonna lose their leverage in uh, Syria. You know, Ukrainians wanted to buy Iron Dome, Israelis said no. It's to me, one reason why, although Turkey supports Ukraine militarily, it also has kept ties with Russia open economically. So Erdogan too doesn't want to completely upset Putin in Syria, because he knows that if he did, then Putin would deny Turkey the ability to fly missions into Syria and to go after uh, 
the, the PKK. So interestingly enough, I think both countries have developed this relationship with Russia. You could say that both Turkey and Israel are hedging. You know, they're allies with the United States, but they're also hedging with Russia. They're both saying, you know, we don't really know how the world is going to look in five years. I don't want to put all my eggs into one basket. I love America, but I also want to have ties with Russia and with other countries. So in this regard, I think Syria is a test case or an example that shows that Israelis and Turks both have to get along with Russia because Russia is a neighbor to both. It occupies and controls Syrian airspace. So neither country can afford to completely alienate uh, Vladimir Putin. And uh, to me, that's the reality of this you know, uh, new, uh, I guess, uh, multipolar uh, world of great power competition. Great, and that brings us to Ukraine, which multiple people asked about. Um, so, uh, particularly with an emphasis on um, whether Turkey would or would not be willing to allow Sweden into NATO, uh, but also uh, tell us a little, just tell us a little more in general about uh, uh, how Turkey is looking at the conflict in, in Ukraine. So, so Turkey's Ukraine policy is uh, another textbook case of how Erdogan can be a Janus face politician, right? He can do opposing things simultaneously. And um, he can also, I think it's called parallel processing. He can, he can process uh, competing goals, moving in opposing directions at the same time. So it's, it's, he's smart, he's very smart, in case you didn't know that. Um, extremely crafty and a good politician. So here's how he runs Ukraine war. Um, Turkey supports Ukraine militarily 100%. It has a lot to do with how the Black Sea looks from Ankara. So Black Sea is an interesting sea. Its only exit to the outside world is through the Bosphorus, which goes through Istanbul. Turkey controls Black Sea's exit and entrance. In 1936, just before, at the, uh, the time of the rise of Nazi Germany, France and the United Kingdom, great powers at the time, they really wanted to have Turkey side with them in the forthcoming war that they knew was going to happen soon. So they were nice to Turkey. The French gave to Turkey part of Syria called Sanjak of Alexandrata. It is today a Turkish province called Hatay. It's actually suffered from the earthquake's destruction. Antioch, old Antioch is there. That was an autonomous part of French mandate Syria. And the French gave it to Turkey because they wanted Turkey to support them and not side with Nazi Germany. Then the British and the French together gave Turkey a bigger gift. They signed a treaty in a Swiss city called Montreux. Uh, these treaties are always signed in Switzerland. And the Montreux Treaty basically says that Turkey is a gatekeeper to the Black Sea. If there is war, it can close the Black Sea, which Turkey has done. No uh, naval vessels can go in or come out. But Montreux says one more thing. It says that only littoral states can maintain large and permanent navies on the Black Sea. There are six coastal states to the Black Sea, Turkey and Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, Romania, and Bulgaria. Of these six, only two have large navies, Turkey and Russia. So the Black Sea is a Turkish-Russian condominium. Turkey therefore sees all Black Sea countries other than Russia as allies because Russia is the militarily superior power. It's a nuclear power. It's a military superpower. Turkey is neither nuclear nor military superpower globally. And so Turkey has excellent ties with all Black Sea countries. Georgia, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria. In fact, you can travel from Turkey to Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova just by showing your ID card, not even passport. So they're like almost integrated. That's because Turkey sees Black Sea countries as allies against Russia, so Turkey will never allow Ukraine to fall under Moscow's control. It will support it. It has been selling drones to Ukraine. These drones made a big difference at the initial phase of the war, for instance, when you know Putin had a blitzkrieg, he wanted to take Kiev in one week, remember? The convoy. So the convoy got stuck because of poor Russian planning, mud, poor Russian planning, and third, drones. Turkish drones helped the Ukrainians defeat Russians and prevented the fall of Kiev. Drones also played a role in sinking of the Russian ship Moskva. You guys remember it? So the Ukrainians used Turkish drones to strike the ship. 
the, the ship, you know, kind of like got dizzy because it was struck by drones and then they use other drones to take it down. So this will continue, Turkey will provide support to Ukraine militarily. Remember I told you something uh, from the podium, I said, everything Turkey does can be split into what is good for Turkey and what is good for Erdogan. So this is what is good for Turkey part. And how, is the, how about the what is good for Erdogan part? Trade with Russia. Turkey's economy is not in good shape. He needs economic uh, growth. He's cultivating resets with uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE. A lot of money has come from those countries. And he's also cultivating economic inflows from Russia. So he's kept ties with Russia open economically while he's supporting Ukraine militarily. That means Turkey is having uh, tourists from Russia, flights coming in, oligarchs bringing money in. I think oligarch money mostly goes to Dubai, but Turkey gets what Dubai doesn't get. Uh, and also inflows, they're significant. So uh, last summer, uh, analysts predicted that Turkey's economy would collapse by the end of the summer. It did not collapse because Putin made a large wire transfer to Turkey in the amount of $15 billion during the summer. That allowed the banks to roll over debt and economy to move forward. Why did Putin do this? I think Putin doesn't like Turkish support to Ukraine. It complicates his problems, but he also appreciates that Turkey provides Russia with access to international markets and airspace. And, you know, one of the uh, fundamentals of US policy on the Ukraine war is sanction Russia, but sanction the oligarchs because Putin is supported by these oligarchs. If you make life miserable for oligarchs, they're gonna turn against Putin. That hasn't really happened uh, because the oligarchs can now go to Dubai, but also if they cannot go to the French Riviera, they can go to the Turkish Riviera. It's as beautiful, cheaper, and so you have, for Putin, Turkish uh, openness economically to Russia is not a bad deal at all. He would ideally like to see Turkey not support Ukraine, but what he has is not a bad deal. So I think I would describe Turkey's Ukraine policy in the following way. Turkey's pro-Ukrainian, but not anti-Russian. It's hard to do. Only Erdogan can do this, you know? So it works. People thought at the beginning of the war it would not work. He has sustained it. And I think he'll continue to stick to it. You know, US government will pressure Turkey to come on board with sanctions. Erdogan will say, look at all the drones I give them. That's a lot. And the, those drones are significant. Ukrainians appreciate it. Uh, the drone is called Bayraktar, which means flag bearer. Uh, this, you know, Ukrainians name their kids after this drone. They're, they're pets because they, they're so grateful to what Turkey is doing. So uh, by no means Turkish support to Ukraine is insignificant. It is very significant and Turkey will do everything to prevent Ukraine from falling under Russian control while keeping ties with Russia open economics. So it's a fascinating case study of Erdogan can be Janus faced. He can do opposing things at the same time and uh, of course, get away with it. You've been very patient with our questions. I'll ask you two more and then we'll, we'll let everybody go. Um, so uh, first thing, these are all questions from the audience. Um, your, your hunch about what's going to happen in the uh, elections, when the elections happen? For the domestic politics? Yeah, we're gonna do a little bit of domestic politics because I've got, I've got one, two, three, including two questions from our undergraduate fellows. Uh, who want to hear about, about uh, Erdogan's odds. Right, so elections in Turkey are supposed to be held before June 18th by constitution. Um, elections are a toss up uh, because last summer there was a lot of talk about whether Erdogan would want to have early elections. He did not because he didn't think he was going to win. I think they are a toss up because the opposition has been unified for the first time, uh, putting a, uh, a, a strong united front. And that is the doing of Erdogan. So his uh, career is marked by uh, successes domestically, defeating the opposition, winning elections. He won over a dozen nationwide elections uh, until recently, all through free and fair races. I would say the last two elections, uh, the vote has been free but the race has not been fair. He controls about 90% of the media. So he can write the narrative of success for himself and defeat for the opposition. It doesn't always work because uh, if your country has been a democracy for 80 years 
and all newspapers write the same thing, you stop reading the newspapers. And that's what people are doing in Turkey, they're switching to social media, they don't buy the newspapers or buy Erdogan's narrative. Turkey also has a pretty large, uh, you know, very active civil society scene and a very large and deep middle class. A lot of people are integrated with uh, global movements. So he's got multiple challenges going forward. He also has the challenge of a unified opposition. Uh, for a very long time, Erdogan was blessed by the fact that opposition groups uh, were, uh, you know, opposing political movements, and the gap between opposition movements, movements was wider than the gap between them and Erdogan. So he could always win elections because the opposition was divided. Then Erdogan uh, did something that I think was a big mistake for him. He switched Turkey's political system from a parliamentary democracy to a presidential system. In a parliamentary democracy, it's a multi-party race, like in Israel, you know, 12 parties running. And the first party doesn't have to get 50%, it just needs to get plura plurality of the votes. In that system, Erdogan always won. His party was the biggest. Then he switched systems because he ran into something inconvenient called term limits, I'm joking. He said, oh, but if I can't run anymore, I'm just gonna change my uh, job title. So he was prime minister, he said, from now on I'll be president. Same, same powers, but different, different title. So, uh, but the switch to presidential system means that the presidential vote requires someone to get 50%. So now he has to get 50, which is very hard for him. He used to get 30, 40, but 50 is tough. But even more importantly, the opposition that had all these opposing groups just realized that if they don't unite, they can never defeat him. So they united forces, and this worked in 2019 when the opposition won elections for mayor in Istanbul and Ankara, other big cities. Now the opposition is doing it again. They're again uh, filling a joint candidate. I think it will all depend on the economy. Uh, economy is why Erdogan has won, as I repeated it, not ideology. And economy is why um, he will win if there's a bounce back. So that's why he's betting heavily on reset with wealthy Gulf monarchies and, re and keeping ties with Russia open economically. He thinks that all the money that comes from these places uh, could help, and they made a that money made a difference. Um, people talked about five billion from Saudi Arabia. Uh, just to told you about this large wire transfer from Russia, Emirati money coming for investment. All this probably made a difference uh, for him. Now the earthquake, of course, um, a, a huge disaster. It could change things. Um, uh, some people in Erdogan's uh, government or allies of him have floated the idea of postponing elections. But uh, technically you cannot postpone the elections. The constitution says they have to be held every five years. If you postpone that, it would be a violation of the constitution. He can declare force majeure. He can say, we really can't have the vote. It's unclear yet um, the scope of the damage in the southern provinces hit by the earthquake. The area hit is the size of the U.S. state of Ohio. Uh, hurt, hit by two earth earthquakes, one 7.8, one 7.6 on the Richter scale, impacting 13 million people. That's one-sixth of Turkey's population. It'd be hard for that area to get to any kind of normalcy soon. Um, I've seen numbers that, that 7,000 apartment blocks have collapsed. If you have 20 units in each, you can do the math of kind of uh, the, the, the scale of destruction, and of course not to forget uh, the suffering of the people. Um, and so he could say this is not okay, possible to have elections, the Constitution says one thing, we need to postpone them. I think, Ron, uh, the best way to describe Turkish politics is that we're entering into what I will call uh, terra incognita, unknown space. Unknown space because, uh, remember, Erdogan came to power after a large earthquake that destroyed the legitimacy of the parties at the time. They were mostly secular parties that embraced Ataturk's thinking, and these parties were voted out because they were not able to provide relief, or the government at the time, in an efficient and timely manner. And the citizens lost their faith in uh, these parties. Now, this is a test for Erdogan. You know, if so far, I would say, perhaps no government could 
uh, you know, face a challenge of this scale. Uh, er twin earthquakes destroying an area the size of Ohio. But even then, I think the aid in Turkey, post-earthquake aid, was slow and uncoordinated. And in some cases, there are still communities, villages that are not being completely reached out to. Uh, right now, I think Turkey is going through what I would call the grief phase of the loss. People are still grieving for their losses. Next will come anger. And then the question will be, who is responsible for uh, code and urban zoning violations, some of which resulted in the deaths? So you see pictures of an entire town destroyed. That's a powerful earthquake. You see pictures of an apartment block destroyed next to an apartment block which has pancaked. That's corruption. Someone cut corners, did not build this building right. That's why it collapsed and the building next to it is standing. So the discussion of responsibility. He's going to try to deflect this saying this is a force majeure. Um, it's what insurance companies say when they don't want to pay you. Uh, or he's, he's going to say, you know, individual corruption of small contractors, but nothing to do with my government. Uh, he's also going to really have a difficult time, I think, because the opposition has said that they're not going to buy this argument of natural disaster, let's all line up behind Erdogan, but they're going to attack him and criticize him. So I think uh, Turkish politics goes into terra incognita because first we need to see and Turkey's population digest um, the scope of this disaster, which hasn't happened yet, because we don't even have an accurate count of how many people lost their lives. The number is still going up. It's at 40,000, sad to say. It could go much higher. Once I think we have a final account of uh, how many people lost their lives, how many are less left homeless, then we'll have a discussion of who's responsible, what went wrong, did aid come in a speedy manner? And if not, then is Erdogan to blame? And at that point, it's a question of uh, how Erdogan looks and whether he's able to deflect criticism that comes at him, at the opposition, whether he can unify and rally his base once again. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, it will be difficult for us to talk about a definite winner of the next election because the earthquake uh, changes most things we know about Turkish politics in the sense that it's, it's such a big disaster that people in Turkey will always remember history as before and after the earthquake. Probably for generations to come because it has impacted so many people and of course so many lives have been lost. So I would say elections are still a toss up. Uh, the vote, will, uh, the race won't be fa fair he controls institutions and media. The vote will be free. Turkey's citizens have been voting since 1950. That's eight gener four generations. People's great-grandparents have voted. People know how to vote. You cannot rig it in Turkey, impossible. Erdogan tried it in 2019 when he lost elections for Istanbul's mayor. He said, oh, I control the media, I control electoral bodies, and his candidate had lost elections by a very narrow margin of only 13,000 votes, insignificant margin in a city of 15 million inhabitants. Repeated elections, the second round, the repeat elections, his candidate lost by almost one million vote margin. That's democratic resilience for you. That's basically people saying, I voted for you, but I don't like the fact that you changed the rules. I'm gonna punish you. So he might postpone elections, it might backfire. He might say, I control institutions, I'm going to have an unfair race. Um, it might backfire. Never bet against democracy in Turkey, I think. Maybe with that, uh, I'm going to end tonight's conversation. I think it's a great place for us to move on.